Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. Today, our interview is with Nishant Sharma. Nishant is head of community relations at Bitmain. This interview was done by Sunny in person at the ETC Summit in Vancouver in early October, just before DevCon. In this conversation, they discussed a number of things. There's the history of Bitmain and some background on the founder, Jihan Wu. He was the first person to translate the Bitcoin white paper into Chinese many years ago. However, as they discussed, Jihan was ousted as CEO in late 2018, early 2019 after a failed IPO. Now, since this interview was recorded in early October, there's no discussion of the recent drama at Bitmain, which some people have qualified as a civil war within the company. So in late October, just a few weeks ago, Jihan Wu regained control of the company in what appears to be some sort of coup. These events are still unfolding, but if you're interested in learning more, you should follow Dovey Wan on Twitter. She is a founding partner at Primitive Crypto, and she's been reporting on and translating a lot of the documents that are coming out of uh, Bitmain. Uh, I'll add her uh, Twitter handle to the show notes. But what they talk about is uh, how Bitmain has grown into uh, to become a superior player in the ASIC manufacturing space and how they balance uh, this part of the business with other business models, mining pools. Of course, Bitmain operates two of the main Bitcoin mining pools, Antpool and BTC.com. And they also talked about Bitmain's role in some of the great debates of the last few years, like the scaling debate, the Bitcoin cash split, ProgPow, etc. I really enjoyed listening to this interview. We've never had an ASIC manufacturer on the podcast before, and it's a topic that we rarely get to cover. So it was interesting to get a glimpse into that business, some of the challenges they face, and of course, looking at the future, although the future is now somewhat uncertain with this drama happening within the company. Anyway, Sonny did a great job on this one, and hats off to him for pulling this off. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about the sponsors which make this show possible. Gold is the oldest and most enduring form of money. It's a hedge against the financial system. It's a hedge against the volatility in crypto. And if you're holding crypto and you want to buy gold, there's no better place to do that than Voltro.com. Voltro is the leading hedging solution for the crypto community. They've been around since 2014. And you can start trading gold as little as one milligram. Now, imagine that the apocalypse is coming, right? Major climate catastrophe, financial markets go to zero, civil unrest, people in the streets, no more infrastructure, no more electricity, nothing. Well, I suspect that in this scenario, people would go back to gold. People would go back to sound money. And if you bought gold with Volturo, well, it's your gold, so you can have it delivered to you. Now, you might not get it delivered after the apocalypse because society has collapsed, but you know, you get on a horse, you go to Switzerland, you, th- you get that gold back, and you've emerged victorious from the apocalypse. You're rolling in the dough, man. Doesn't that sound good? That sounds good to me, and that's why I'm buying gold with Volturo, to hedge my bets against the upcoming apocalypse. If that sounds good to you, go to Volturo.com and start trading today. And once you create your account, you can click on the little yellow support button at the bottom of the website and let them know you heard about them on Epicenter. And I also want to mention, now this is not investment advice, I'm just letting you know that Voltoro is currently raising funds. So if you go to blog.voltoro.com, there's an article there that explains their current funding round on Bank to the Future. It's open to the public. I believe they've raised over a million dollars right now, and there's about 10 days left on the funding round. So if you're interested in learning more about that, go to the blog and check it out. We'd like to thank Volturo for their support of Epicenter. We're also brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Now, in preparation for the upcoming inter-blockchain communications protocol, IBC, they are announcing the second ever adversarial testnet challenge, Game of Zones. Now, this is a competition that will create an educational opportunity for people to learn about the nuances in the IBC protocol because an interoperable blockchain has never been done before. There's lots to learn before we launch this you know, in production. The competition will start in December or January. The dates are still uh, being finalized, but the Interchain Foundation is providing 100,000 atoms in a prize pool for winning teams. 
And so there will be uh, multiple prizes attached to multiple challenges. So if you have an interesting project that can leverage IBC, you should definitely go to cosmos.network slash G-O-Z. And there you can uh, get involved by joining the Riot chat where you can chat with members of the Cosmos team and other projects that are you know, potentially taking part in Game of Zones. It's going to be really cool. We're looking forward to seeing what comes out of this. You should also check out the Cosmos blog because as I'm recording this just a few minutes ago, they've just released the recap article for the SF Blockchain Week DeFi Hackathon. There are all the winners announced, lots of pictures and videos. Uh, Definitely check it out if you weren't there. And there's even a picture of me doing a weird DeFi VR thing. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. And with that, we go to Sunny's interview with Nishant Sharma. So we're here today live, actually. First time I'm ever doing an episode live. And so we're here today at the Ethereum Classic Summit, and we're out here in the lobby recording. There's a bunch of new events coming up next couple of weeks, and so we tried to do something different and uh, do some live recordings at these events, see who we can grab from the crowd and put on a good uh, episode. And so we'll see how it goes. And given that it's a live event and I'm the only host this time, it's also my first time soloing as a host. So I'm here today with uh, Nishan Sharma. He's the head of community relations at Bitmain, one of the, well, not one of the, I'd, I'd say the largest ASIC manufacturing company. And it also operates a number of mining pools. So Nishan, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, thanks for having me. I'm a fan of uh, Epicenter. I've been hearing a lot of good things about it. And always a pleasure to meet you uh, at different conferences, Sunny. Uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, so talking about myself, I joined the cryptocurrency space in early 2014 by joining an ASIC maker based out of Shenzhen. And then uh, when the 2015 bear market happened, we realized we couldn't keep up. And we had to pull the plug. And then I joined uh, the company that was doing everything right, everything we wanted to do right. Bitmain was doing it right. So I joined Bitmain in 2016, beginning of 2016. Which ASIC company was that uh, before you joined Bitmain? It was called Bitcrane, B-I-T-C-R-A-N-E, like a crane that does mining. <laughs> yeah, the how I came across that one was, uh, so I was working in Guangzhou for in the LED industry in China. And uh, the company was uh, not very interesting. Like the company's product wasn't that good. And uh, yeah, the LED industry in China was just overloaded. It was oversupplied. And uh, it was surely not uh, the, co- the best company to work for at that time. So I was looking for uh, other things to do. And then I met uh, this Taiwanese American guy who had secured the chips from HashFast's liquidation. He was planning to make ASIC miners based out of Shenzhen using those chips. And that sounded like a very cool, exciting idea. And uh, the person seemed like someone I can uh, bet my career on. And uh, so I did that. I joined him and it was a great ride until the bear market of 2015 happened. Cool. And so what would you say is your sort of role at Bitmain? So, you know, I I met you first time uh, last year in December. We were at this weird event. It was sort of like, it wasn't officially a Bitcoin Cash event, but it was essentially a Bitcoin Cash event. And so I met you and a bunch of the Bitcoin Cash team uh, that led to our two-part episode with Amari. But then I've seen you again at multiple events, at Ethereum events, at, at the Zcash conference, today at Ethereum Classic event, and then we're both going to DevCon next week. So uh, tomorrow, right. And so what would you say is sort of your job? When it, what, 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 what does it mean to be a community relations manager for a mining company? So that's a good question because uh, Bitmain is very unique, uh, not just because of its size, but because also its role that it plays in all the proof of work cryptocurrencies that it makes products for. It impacts those cryptocurrency communities. It is an integral part of the ecosystem. So what we do matters a lot to these cryptocurrency ecosystems. So we want to act more responsibly. And that's why a major part of my job is to maintain dialogue with these cryptocurrency communities. So it's more with the sort of communities like rather than uh, with the miners themselves. So that, or there's other people who, hand, who handle maybe, I don't know, minor relations. Yes, that would be the sales team of the Ant Miner brand. Uh, so they would deal with that. And so that's why you see me at events like the ATC Summit now or at the Zcash conference or the Ethereum conference or other events where there are multiple communities coming together. Yes, that's a major part of my job. The second part, a smaller part, is the PR strategy for Bitmain, the holding company. 
So I don't do PR for the Antminer brand or for the BTC.com brand or Antpool. Uh, they have their own PR and marketing teams. I only do strategic PR for the holding company. And if there's any guidance needed for these brands, I give them. That's the second part of my job. Could you give a brief summary so the listeners have an idea? What are some of the main major brands that Bitmain is, has? So Bitmain is, a, is the best example of vertical integration in the crypto ecosystem. So Bitmain makes the chips, it makes the machines, it operates, uh, uh, builds and operates mining farms for others as a service. It also builds and operates mining farms where it has its own stake as well, which is where it's mining for itself, which is a smaller part of the business. Then it also operates mining pools that these mining farms would connect to. And uh, it also has a collaboration with a cloud mining service now. It's called BitDeer, B-I-T-D-E-E-R. And of course, another major business of Bitmain is uh, the AI business, where we are making chips for AI, um, where, where we are making chips uh, like TPUs, like Google's TPUs. We also call them TPUs. Um, this one is called Sophon, S-O-P-H-O-N. Your listeners can go to sophon.ai to check it out or even place orders. We have uh, four generations of new chips already released in AI uh, since 2016. So that's going strong. Yeah, these are major businesses of Bitmain. It probably doesn't cover everything Bitmain does, which is a lot of things that Bitmain does in this space. We also invest in a lot of startups and open source projects in this space to grow this space. Yeah, these are the major things we do. Cool. And so, you know, I, I actually asked you uh, earlier if we could get the new CEO uh, of Bitmain. What was his name again? Hai Chai Wong. Hai Chai Wong. Uh, and, but, you know, you mentioned to me that he, he tends to be more of a sort of reserved guy, doesn't prefer to make... Uh, large public appearances, which is, I guess you could say, quite a bit of a departure from the previous CEO, uh, Jihan, because, you know, he was very well known, very active in the community. Is this like, was this a decision that was made from, you know, as a purposeful shift from the past? Or is this a general, like, a cultural difference between Chinese companies and American while uh, Jihan maybe was an exception? Uh, to answer your question, it was, it is the latter. Um, there's a cultural difference in companies in the West and companies in China um, because of the social political nature of China. So the companies are less out there and they have a lesser need than companies in the West to be out there. Yeah, that's the uh, major reason. And talking about the difference in back then and now, the difference is mainly because of Jihan. He is a well-known person in the crypto sphere even before Bitmain was a thing because he translated the Bitcoin white paper to Chinese. He was the first person in the world to do that. Oh, wow. Didn't know that. Yeah, because he saw uh, the value of it. He saw the value of Bitcoin before anyone in China or anyone who speaks Chinese only saw the value. And uh, then he started uh, Bitmain much later. And because he was driven by this cause, and when the great scaling debate of Bitcoin happened, he, he had a strong opinion on it. That's why he was out there even when he was CEO of Bitmain, because he really cares about Bitcoin and the road it's taking. He really wanted Bitcoin to grow the way it's, uh, he, he, he believes was the best way and many others believe too. And that is why you saw him more out there. And when the great scaling debate was over by Bitcoin cash forking off from Bitcoin, there was no need and you didn't see Jihan out there after that like he was before. And then changing, uh, the, getting a new CEO was just uh, a normal evolution of the company, which is the same in the West or anywhere when the company grows so, so big. Um, the CEOs often tend to assign the role to someone who they think is uh, a better person to be at the wheel. And that's what happened with the new change. And the new CEO, like I mentioned, ch companies in China do not have this need or prefer not to be out there so much. So he's not so out there yet. And so you come and take his place. <laughs> I, I can't because there's so much happening at Bitmain that I don't know about. It's such a big company. Um, so I can't, maybe I know only the tip of the iceberg, okay. but the CEO would know everything. So he would be surely a much better representative of Bitmain than I can ever be. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I've heard people refer to you as Jihan's right hand man, and so I figured maybe he, that's why I agreed to the interview. So oh, I think that's uh, that, that's misguiding to say that because uh, um, there are many people that are uh, helping Jihan, and it's not just me. I'm just one of them. But I guess I'm more out there in the cryptocurrency communities outside China. So that's why you may have heard of that from some people in the cryptocurrency space outside China. So could you tell me a little bit about the history of Bitmain? And so, yeah, when was it created? And what was, was it always a mining uh, ASIC company? Or was that something they pivoted into? Who's the founders? So that's a good question. Uh, I will tell you what I know. 
um, which won't be every detail, but I will go into as many details as I can here. So Jihan was always into uh, researching about currencies, how they, the role they play in the evolution of mankind and the world today. And when he read about Bitcoin, despite the language gap and the cultural gap, he knew it was uh, a game changer and it would change the world we live in. And so he bet everything he could, but even borrowed money from his friends and family to buy more Bitcoins. And uh, even when the price plummeted the first time from uh, like nearly $40 to $50 to $2, he only borrowed more money and maxed out his credit card to buy more Bitcoins. And then he was just counting the days it would take him to do a job, which like the one he was doing at that time, uh, to pay off all that money if Bitcoin didn't work out. And then, uh, yeah, it worked out eventually. And he also started a small mining operation somewhere in China. I don't know the details of that, but it wasn't as big as you would imagine it to be now. And then it, that paid off well. And then he invested in a fried cat startup through the Global Bitcoin Stock Exchange back then, which was uh, mentioned and introduced on bitcointalk.org back in the day. Uh, and that paid off very well. Then uh, he researched on uh, ASICs because uh, ASICs was how fried cat was giving such good returns to its investors, to his investors. And then uh, he, he somehow stumbled across Mike Ree, the co-founder, who had previously approached the VC firm that Jihan was working for to raise funds for another startup that Mike Ree wanted to do. So now Jihan, when he has this idea, stumbles across Mike Ree again, explains to Mike Ree about his ideas on ASIC making for Bitcoin mining. And Mike Ree, after thinking more about it and researching Bitcoin a bit, uh, I think Mike Ree said it was two hours that he took to understand Bitcoin and uh, research it. He said yes. <laughs> And that's how they founded Bitmain. Was it a Freudian slip? Is that, <laughs> are they maybe actually Satoshi? <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> so they started with ASIC manufacturing from the get-go. They, they didn't like... Not manufacturing, fabulous design, the design. So oh. Bitmain is a fabulous design, ASIC design company. We don't manufacture it. The oh, they're manufactured okay. by TSMC in Taiwan, okay. a factory we outsource it to. Just like most fabulous chip companies that you've heard of, like NVIDIA or AMD or ARM or Intel or Apple. Oh, Intel, sorry, makes their own chips. They are the exception. But everyone else outsources them to a factory like TSMC, um, which is the best in the world at the moment to make chips. But so then the goal was always uh, ASIC design, not yes. mining pool. Because I, I know yes. there's a num couple of ASIC manufacturers who, or designers who started running mine, mining and then they decided, oh, you know, to get the edge, we need to start building our own stuff. Seems like Bitmain came from the other direction, really. Yeah, I mean, I think every other example that I know of today followed Bitmain's lead. They saw what Bitmain did and they did the same. Uh, Bitmain is the best example of vertical integration in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So uh, Bitmain makes the chips, Bitmain makes the miners, sells them on its website, so it has a re retail website too that it's operating. Then it operates, uh, builds and maintains mining farms of the larger scale. Uh, they have the most experience and also operates mining pools that these mining farms would connect to later. And it also has Bitcoin wallet uh, under the brand of bdc.com. It also has bdc.com blockchain analysis and explorer and other anal analytic services for, uh, for the blockchain. So yeah, it's very well vertically integrated into the space. And when Bitmain's uh, example was uh, out there, others did the same. Cool. So yeah, let's jump into talking a little bit about the uh, uh, mining hardware. So currently, you know, Bitmain obviously is the largest uh, manufacturer or seller of ASIC hardware. Do you know roughly what percent of, you know, I've heard numbers like as high as up to like 70% of the ASIC uh, market. Uh, do, you, do you have any more, you know, precise numbers of like roughly how many, let's say, let, I guess it's hard to say because of different coins. Let's say Bitcoin as an example of what, how, do you guys have an estimate of how, what percentage of the ASIC market? It's unknowable because... Uh you don't know who, which machine mined uh, the coin or, well, because it's mined from mining about, pools. By, how about by ASIC sales, though? I think we've never done this kind of uh, comprehensive analysis. And it's also hard because we can't be sure which customer who bought tons of machines from us maybe three years ago is still mining with those machines. We don't know. So it's really unknowable. Even if we did such an analysis, it would be way off the correct answer. But... It's a widely accepted fact and something that Frost and Sullivan uh, reported in their report uh, that we have about 70% of the market. Even at today at the uh, conference at the Ethereum Classic Summit, uh, you know, you were on a mining panel, which was a great panel. Um, and there seems to be like a sense of resentment 
in many different communities often uh, against Bitmain, where that it's a little bit maybe too big. And to me, it's a little bit of villainizing your success in a way. So yeah, wh- why do you think that like there is this general sense of resentment towards Bitmain as a company? They're kind of seen as sometimes as a bit of a boogeyman in the space. Uh, that's a good question. So of course, I've given it a lot of thought <laughs> in my role as PR for Bitmain. And first, I used to think it was because of our involvement in the great scaling debate that all this started. Well, it did start because of that. It uh, increased this uh, political hatred against Bitmain uh, at that time when we were in the great scaling debate. But it stayed that way, not because of that only. It stayed that way because we have become so competitive and big. And this reminds people in the cryptocurrency communities who join these cryptocurrency communities to escape the establishment outside the space of the establishment. So that is a, a reason that we that is inescapable when you are competitive and successful or uh, as successful as you can be. And that, that, that is something that we couldn't have avoided even if we were not involved in the great scaling debate. And that is something that I was reminded of again today when there was this panel today in the EDC summit about uh, governance or community. And someone asked who would be the biggest threat to ETC. And the answer promptly came from one of the panelists was the person with the maximum of money. <laughs> yeah, cryptocurrency communities by nature of their trustlessness, by nature of their suspicion of the establishment, have this inherent suspicion against any competitive or established player. Do you think that there's the mining heart space is inherently centralizing? Is there a sort of fundamental incompatibility between competitive capitalism, which the mining space is, and decentralization? Thanks for asking that question. I don't think it's uh, the case. I think what is often described as centralization in this context is actually just competition. And competition will always lead to one player emerging competitive than the others, if it's fair competition. And so the more fair the competition is, the more you will see a successful player emerge. And that successful player will be the victim of this uh, hatred of uh, so-called centralization. Are you familiar with uh, the economist Joseph Schumpeter? No. He also is a you know well-known political economist. Uh, you know His entire theory of competition is basically he thinks that in a competitive marketplace you will have these monopolies and oligopolies but competition really comes through innovation and the term he's most famous he coined was this term called creative uh, creative destruction where you kind of at any given moment there is no ASIC manufacturer like that maybe you know there's one ASIC manufacturer that's the largest which is you guys but competition at one moment, there might not be, look like there's a amount of competition, but over time, if you look in the scale, maybe who is that largest ASIC manufacturer at any given my time keeps changing. Yeah, that's true. Um, so before, when I joined the space, Bitmain was one of the underdogs. The biggest players or the most hailed players were Butterfly Labs, Pondulis, KNC Miner. Uh, these were the big names. And then there were some others that surely were scams. <laughs> They were the big names, and Bitmain was just one of the underdogs. And of course, uh, Frightcat, that's the one that makes the best miners, and there was no reason to doubt they won't. They shipped their products, they had the best product at that time. And there was, of course, Avalon, the first ASIC manufacturer in the world with the biggest head start. Bitmain came from nowhere with not enough resources to compete with these well-funded companies. Uh, many of these were uh, well-funded companies. So how did it do it? By just being uh, the best, <laughs> by taking... Uh, uh, so I was working for a competitor of Bitmain at that time. And all of, our, all of our customers would come back and tell us everything we are trying to do, Bitmain was doing the best in that. So they would tell me that, hey, your product shipped later than Bitmain's product. But I ordered the Bitmain's product at the same time when it reached me before yours did. Hey, your machine couldn't work seven days even after I got it. My Bitmain product has been working for one month and no problems. Every time, everything that happened wrong in any other manufacturer, turns out Bitmain was doing right. And these were not very innovative things. These were not very um, groundbreaking things they were doing right. They were just simple things like supply chain management, efficient supply chain management, a machine that is reliable, a machine that performs as advertised. 
So would you say it was more of a operational project or was it more of a technical like uh, In the beginning, it was operational because the first chip that uh, the S1, the first machine from Bitmain, wasn't even using a totally in-house design. The chip was designed by outsourcing it to other uh, chip engineers from Russia and some US and some outsourced uh, designs. It's only after S3, I believe, that Bitmain made its own in-house, completely in-house design of chips. So it wasn't purely technical in the beginning, it was operational. And then it became technical with, uh, when they had more funds and when they saw the returns being promising. Hmm. I see. And so you guys started working on, you know, the first famous miner was the S1, uh, and that came out in a, remember, 2015, I think, right? Yeah, it wasn't the most competitive. Right. Even S2 wasn't the most competitive. Even S3 yeah. wasn't the most competitive. And S5 turned out to be the most competitive. That was, was that game like your iPhone product where it's like, oh, yeah, now we... Yeah, game changer. I and see. it wasn't just because... I mean, we could have had competition maybe. I don't know. But it came out when the 2015 bear market happened. So this was a make or break for us at that time. So That's it, when all the other ASIC manufacturers were going out of business. Yes. So we would have gone out of business too if we did not release a very competitive product, which we managed to. That kept Bitmain alive through the bear market of 2015. Not thriving, just alive. And after that, yeah, when the bear market uh, turned around and yeah, Bitmain was already prepared for it. When did you guys start working on uh, ASICs for other chains as well? We started doing that much after I joined Bitmain, which was in 2016. I cannot remember which was the first altcoin miner we released. But uh, maybe it was the Litecoin miner. Yeah, I'm not sure now. But I think it was the Litecoin miner in the and near the end of 2016, somewhere in 2016. So that's when we ventured into other coins, and we never turned around. We've been making cryptocurrency miners since then. On How many different uh, hashing algorithms do you guys make miners for? On the top of my head, maybe five. I mean, because it's a, a tough question because we are not making them right now. Maybe we made Litecoin miners back in the day. We made eth, eth hash miners two years ago. We are not selling them now. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we are going to make them again in the future because that's part of our confidential R&D in-house. Maybe we can walk through a little bit about what the life cycle of a chip is because you know I'm actually not too familiar with this. And so it's, so it's not like there's a constant production of like, you know, most manufacturing, you know, you have a constant shipment of, okay, we have like, couple hundred uh, ASICs coming off the assembly line every day. So what you seem to be describing is it's like, okay, a batch production and then sale process. Or one thing I am aware of in the mining world is it's often sometimes sale and then batch production. So could you walk through a little bit about what is the strategy team at Bitmain decided, okay, you know what, we want to go build ASICs for Zcash. What comes next? What's the timeline? So the timeline is changing depending on the difficulty of the algorithm or the difficulty of the particular ASIC. I believe it used to be uh, the whole product life cycle when I joined the space used to be three months, <laughs> the whole cycle. That time these chips were like 40 nanometer, even bigger processes than 40 nanometer. Because in three months, the difficulty of uh, Bitcoin was rising like crazy. It was just skyrocketing. So after three months, your miner becomes obsolete. In general computing, they have this Moore's law of like doubling every two years. Do you guys have like a equivalent in the mining world? It's a smooth launch steroids. <laughs> There's no word for it. Is there a rough, but if, is there a, uh, you know, okay, the, these chips become deprecated in how long? There's no such law. It just depends on the competition. So if another player comes up with a better chip, it will keep uh, pushing the difficulty even higher yeah, and make the difficulty increase even steeper than it was before. So it depends a lot on the competition. So when I joined, there was a lot of competition. Like I mentioned, uh, this was, no, oh, I didn't mention now. Um, this was like when everyone was thinking Bitcoin mining was analogy to the California gold rush. This, everyone thought, make the shovels and you will make more money than the gold diggers. And so everyone was making ASICs. When I joined the space, there were so many companies around the world making ASICs. And that was pushing the difficulty even more steeper. And if you release a new ASIC miner, which is most efficient to mine Bitcoin in the world now, maybe next week someone else releases one and then you have a problem at your hands. And the only solution is to release a better one than your previous one before any other competitor does. There was no other way around it. And so in the beginning, the life cycle was like three months, then it became six months, then one year. 
And then when we released the S9, which was one that everyone game changer of. at yeah. that time, yeah, the Antminer S9 based on the 16 nanometer process, that was uh, breaking like this threshold uh, in the industry, a technical threshold that everyone was stuck with. And the S9 stayed for the longest time in Bitmain's history or in the history of Bitcoin. No one generation of miners stayed this long. I was looking on the website today and it, you, I think you guys are still selling the S9. Yes, they are still being sold. People are still buying them or buying even secondhand S9 miners now. So S9 uh, survived or was profitable even for masses. Of course, there are people who can get almost free electricity. For them, even an S7 is still profitable. But for the masses or generally speaking, S9 was profitable for about three years. That is a, a big change uh, compared to the three months life, uh, life cycle that I entered the industry with. <laughs> So yeah, let's jump back into the uh, timeline. So okay, back to the story of uh, Zcash ASIC. So okay, we decide to make the ASIC. Do we start designing first, or do we start like you know, or do we try to gauge, try to get pre-orders? How do, how does that work? We start designing the chip. Well, we before we even deciding to design the chip, we will see what what the community's uh, beliefs or sentiment is about these things. We don't want to do something that seems like we are uh, fighting the community or doing something against their roadmap. We don't want to disrupt what their plans are. So first we make sure that the community doesn't have any, you know, hard feelings against such uh, plans that we may have. Because we don't want to make any investment of our time and money on something that the community wouldn't like, right? It's counterproductive. Aren't there some cases though, like pretty well publicized about like, you know, sometimes the community wasn't quite fully aware or accepting the one I know is I'm good friends with David from Saya. And so, you know, he, you know, I know from the Saya community, there was quite a bit of drama last year. Yes. Yeah, so, um, the community relations part we have, uh, although we have increased this since the last two years before that, it wasn't so effective and we didn't do it for every community because we have limited resources at our end right now. It's just me doing it and, uh, we're looking at expanding the team. So I have more help so I can, keep my ears on the ground in many communities, not just one uh, at a time. Usually it's hard to keep up with so much happening overnight all the time in different time zones uh, for one person. So SIA wasn't something we were following at that time. And also SIA algorithm was purposely an ASIC friendly algorithm because the founder envisioned making money by selling ASICs for his own coin. So that makes it easy for anyone to make ASIC minus four. It's kind of assumed that they were going to be welcoming of ASICs. Yes, that's what you would assume. But uh, it seems like he was very surprised that the biggest uh, ASIC mining manufacturer, ASIC miner maker in the space, was making ASICs or announced they will make ASICs for a coin that is ASIC friendly. Yeah, that, that doesn't make sense to me. One of the common critiques against many ASIC manufacturing companies is this idea of hidden mining. And so could you like maybe describe a little bit about what hidden mining is? So hidden mining or secret mining, as it's popularly called, is a practice of an ASIC maker using next generation products secretly to mine a cryptocurrency and not releasing it to the market or the public. And our policy on secret mining is uh, uh, no tolerance. We have a zero tolerance policy published on our blog. It's part of our transparency initiatives. What does it mean to have a zero tolerance? Like, is it like there were situations where like employees of Bitmain or some ASIC manufacturers were mining? Into that means we will never do it and we will never endorse someone who does it. That's what it means. Would you also say, has Bitmain ever secret mined before? Never. Because Bitmain's always been working at a very large scale and it's a major income generator or source of income is selling the machines, which is less riskier than mining it, mining with the machines yourself. What about scenarios, for example, in like Monero, there were cases where Monero was concerned that there were ASICs and they kind of announced that they're going to hard fork to fix it. And then the hash rate dropped by like 80%. And this is right around the same time, about two months before Bitmain announced their I think it was the XM3s, or I forgot what the exact number was. X3, I guess. X3, uh, yeah. Called. Yeah, so what would be your response to those allegations? Uh, I, I believe no one in the community raised allegations against Bitmain. It was quite clear for everyone in the community that it wasn't Bitmain doing it. So I heard during this conference, EDC Summit 2, people speculating on other ASIC manufacturers having done it. I'm sure it could be some of the ASIC manufacturers who, are, who could have done it. Probably a smaller one because a, a one that is big uh, of the size of Bitmain, it doesn't make sense because there are thousands of people 
who who will find out at bitmain and the word will get out so there's no reason for us to do that compared to making money by selling the machine instantly so yeah we are just disincentivized to do that but it could have been a smaller player and also there are players who like uh, david that you mentioned of sia coin they advertise their business model as being secret mining as a service that's their business model so assuming they even have one single customer secret mining is happening if we assume there that companies like david's even has one customer one thing i never quite understood is why is secret mining so frowned upon well okay i understand that if you so if you promise to sell customers and you're mining on stuff that they paid for yes i guess my question is why does bitmain sell asics instead of mining using them as i mentioned in my talk too the major source of income for bitmain is selling the machines and more importantly selling a mining experience to the users of the machine because we just don't want to sell the machine once we want to keep the customers coming back for more and to do that we have to sell a good mining experience to the customer not just a machine which is the reason bitmain succeeded during the time when everyone was making asics you know the back in the day now if we start competing unfairly with new generation asics with our customers it will jeopardize their mining experience and our cash cow don't why even sell in the first place i agree like you know if you're selling some and then you're competing with the so customers so now assuming bitmain is a smaller company looking and doesn't want to stay in the business for more than one or two years and just wants to make quick money we would have to be smaller for sure i i think it actually needs a larger company in a way where instead of selling you guys have the largest asic manufacturing and now instead of selling it to a bunch of miners around the world wouldn't it be better to use your economies of scale become find the largest warehouse in the world you can with and you know get a great partnership with an electricity company and just run the largest mining farm why sell your asics instead of using them yourself as the, the simplest idea. answer is to distribute risk if we do it ourselves we are betting on the price going up we are betting on others not doing the same we are betting on the difficulty staying uh, stable so we are betting on a lot of things and imagining that kind of investment it's just uh, crazy risky to do that that makes sense but you know if you're trying to hedge wouldn't it make sense to maybe sell off a portion not not vast majority right so that's what what we kind of do but uh, we keep a very small portion of the farm ourselves and we sell the vast majority of the mining farm that's uh, our mining farm business it just seems very odd to me the road's like and is this what like all asic manufacturing a companies smaller do? Ma- uh, asic manufacturer may may find it profitable to mine themselves especially yeah. if their miners are not competitive enough to sell in the market against bitmain's miners then it would make sense for them to do it in secret um with some very friendly electricity cost or some other cost cutting measures to keep it profitable in the, yeah. for some time because i've you know i i've thought about buying a, an asic before just for fun just to try it out and then i was like look, thinking about it like why is this company selling this to me like it seems that if it's profitable to mine using this they should be using it themselves clearly if it's not i'm the schmuck for buying this when it might not actually okay so it's more about you know risk management sort of yes. so what percentage of asics does bitmain that are manufactured uh does bitmain use itself like not in order to sell ever but just in almost general. negligible negligible so mining for ourselves is the smallest part of the business we do it just to keep our feet wet so we know what the customers go through and because it's also a part of a business where we build mining farms for others how can we be doing that if we don't build mining farms for ourselves or if we've never built any mining farm so we build the mining farm we maybe if we have a share in the mining farm that we built we would not have more than 10 to maybe 13% in one mining farm that's the part we will own the rest will be given to other investors who can mine any coin they want in that share of the mining farm or maybe not even mine a cryptocurrency maybe they can be using it for big data ai applications um uh, whatever they want to do with their part of the data center okay so you guys don't run a large mining farm but what you guys do do is run some of the largest mining pools and so how did that start so the the two biggest ones in bitcoin are antpool and btc.com one question for us right off the bat why have two pools instead of merging into one pool well, that's a good question because naturally you wouldn't uh think of having two pools instead of one so 
for answering your first part of the question, which is uh, why we did the pools at all. So it's the founder's vision, the founder's vision that we started making ASICs when people did not think making ASICs would be that profitable. They started doing that long ago. And then it was part of their vision to have us vertically integrated into the space. So not just making the chips or the machines or the mining farms, but also the mining pools that the mining farms connect to. So it's part of the vertical integration uh, vision that they had. And now why do we have two pools? It's because we want to keep Bitcoin as decentralized as we can. We realize that having a lot of hash power in one pool causes problems if the pool has some vulnerability or some problem. So these pools are uh, one of the, the second pool that came later, BDC.com, started as open source pool, totally open source. The world's first totally open source large scale pool. That was the vision of the founders to have an open source pool. And and pool is not an open source pool. So that's one big difference. What does it mean to be an open source pool versus a closed source pool? Means all the code is out there. Anyone can just copy the code and make. And after and pool was founded, many other pools that came after it are using the tools and competitive advantages that BTC.com have. They're using those because they could copy it from the code of uh, BTC.com pool. The reason for separation is as a security mechanism to avoid software vulnerabilities and pool software? Yes, and to decentralize uh, the mining space more. So the teams are totally different. The engineers are totally different. Their CEOs are different of BDC.com and Antpool. They are located in separate places, Singapore, yeah. Beijing. Um, they have, yeah, they're totally different. How answerable or influenceable are they by the Bitmain uh, holding company? Their job is to make profit. And that's what they're doing. And so Bitmain Holding Company will not tell them to do something else as long as they are uh, making profit. These two pools are now, I think, the second and third largest mining pools in it's Bitcoin. It's changing all the time. Sometimes they're first and second. Yeah. Sometimes they're first and third. Yeah. With Poolin Pool coming in came second. in recently. So yeah, Poolin was founded by uh, a former BDC.com uh, employee, um, three former BDC.com employees who started the BDC.com mining pool with, with the open source code. So yeah, they have that experience from Bitmain's uh, BDC.com pool. And so if you take uh, these two uh, together, do you know roughly what the hash rate of BTC.com and uh, and pool together are? Uh, It's always changing, but I guess it's about 35 to 40%, maybe even lesser. Uh, Yeah, now maybe lesser, 32 to 40% in between that. I know... There's there's also always these uh, conspiracy theories about the uh, Bitmain's relationship as well with uh, via BTC, where you know it is a separate company, independent, but there's heavy investment from Bitmain and stuff. And so, if you add that into you know a level of influence that Bitmain has, like, do you think now we're over fifty percent? No, still not. Still not. Because over. BTC is one of the smaller pools now. Okay. And also, uh, we published a blog post about it long ago about our association with YBDC. So we invested in YBDC, but we have uh, almost no decision-making power there. So the decision-making power of the founder, that is Hypo Young, is about 10 or 20 times more than any of the investors. So yeah, we have almost no influence in that way. Uh, No legally binding influence. But of course, if Hypo Young wants to follow Bitmain or do what Bitmain is doing or uh, go with the ideology of Bitmain, that's up to him. And that's up to any, any other pool in the world for them to do it or not. But yeah, we don't have any legal influence or any binding influence over YBDC. Why do you think it is that the Bitmain operated mining pools are so popular? So I think uh, the sim- answer is very simple. Uh, wh- how did Bitmain become so big? It didn't have a head start. It was an underdog. It didn't even have the resources to make ASICs. The design had to be outsourced in the beginning. It's because they just found everything that the customer cares for and made it the best possible. And that is what the mining pools did too. So when I joined the space, the biggest mining pool was uh, ghash.io and they had 50% of the hash rate of Bitcoin and no one thought anyone could ever replace those pools. But then (laughs) a few years later, Bitmain has the world's biggest pool called Antpool and much later then Bitmain starts another pool with a totally different team, totally open source, which also becomes... uh, the world's biggest pool, uh, beating Bitmain's own other biggest pool and pool. I think the reason for these fluctuations is because of the competitive advantages these pools offer. And these competitive advantages are very concrete. For example, you would go to the biggest mining farm owners and you would ask them what they need most from the pool. 
And depending on what he says, you can provide many of those things. Maybe he wants a dedicated customer support. Okay, you provide him that. Maybe he wants a better rate on what he's mining on your pool. You can provide him that if he's really big. You can provide him a special rate. You can, yeah, these kind of things. It's just collecting feedback from the customer, giving what the customer wants. It's as simple as that. But not everyone manages to do it. But Bitmain managed to pull it off, not once, but twice. So jumping back to the uh, ASIC manufacturing side, who would you say is nowadays your largest competitor when it comes to ASIC manufacturing? I do design? not know who the biggest competitor is, but uh, it keeps changing. I believe the, some there are some good machines in the market. Machines from eBank, machines from uh, Bitfury, uh, from uh, Kanan, the Beijing-based company, the first company that's uh, the first company to make ASICs, uh, ASIC miners, still making ASIC miners. Uh, InnoSilicon. Yeah, these are the ones making ASICs for Bitcoin. One of the concerns about ASICs is that the they're very sticky. And like, if you have a large market share, there's definitely, a, there's probably some sort of, you know, as in all hardware stuff, there's economies of scale. And if I had a up and start ASIC company, it would be very difficult for me to get the access to the fabs and the connections and stuff that Bitmain has. Do you think these concerns are founded? I do not think so. Because again, coming from my personal experience, I joined the space when Bitmain was an underdog. You know, they, they, the only thing that made them as big as they are now, or we are now, is being competitive and doing whatever you can best. It's and fair competition. There was no unfair competition. There was no Bitcoin god or Satoshi helping Bitmain, pulling some strings, changing Bitcoin's code to favor Bitmain's mining machines or something. There was no manipulation. It was just pure competition. And that is how Bitmain became as established as it is now. And similarly, another player could come in and do the same, even now, today. Mining Bitcoin was that profitable and stays as profitable. I, I see bigger players from outside the bit crypto space entering this space. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, what, what happens when, are you guys prepared for, let's say, an in, Intel or NVIDIA? It's to hard to say. They're surely more the established than Bitmain in chip design and chip manufacturing even. When it comes to Intel, they even make yeah. their own chips. Um, so they are surely more established. But... I don't know um, what will How happen. How do you think the mining space as a whole would change if one of these manufacturers comes in? I think then people would finally see Bitmain as the messiah, <laughs> as the savior. <laughs> uh -huh. Because right now, a lot of the hatred that Bitmain gets is for being uh, quite big <laughs> and making um, more profit than other ASIC manufacturers. And once there's a bigger company making much more profit than Bitmain, uh, people would see, hope that Bitmain challenges that company and becomes, uh, takes a big part of the profit share of that company. Has, has there been any hints or like rumors of one of these big players entering? So there were, no, the, the, there is no any concrete news or any concrete rumors, but just talking about rumors, there were rumors about Samsung making chips to mine crypto. And there were headlines like Samsung's going to enter this space and going to take Bitmain head on and stuff like that. And they were so baseless, these news, uh, because Samsung is a fab. They do not make chips or machines. It was just a fab order by one of uh, the other companies that make ASICs. And some company just ordered uh, a Samsung to make uh, chips for cryptocurrency mining for, you know, for themselves, uh, not for Samsung, but for whichever company it was. So as we mentioned earlier, you know, Bitmain got quite a bit of notoriety in a little bit because of its large role in the great scaling debates, which eventually, you know, led to Bitmain being a large part of the initial creation of Bitcoin Cash. So can you tell me a little bit about why, you know, like we mentioned, like why go from a neutral arms dealer to someone with a heavy stake and like political opinion when it comes to... As I mentioned today in my talk too, that... Bitmain has always adhered to its founding values and the founders of Bitmain, they bet on Bitcoin's economics, Bitcoin's technology, Bitcoin's power to change the world at a time when no one thought much of Bitcoin or hadn't even heard about Bitcoin. That's when the founders of Bitmain bet on Bitcoin. And that is something that Bitmain sticks to all the time. So during the great scaling debate, Bitmain continued to stick to the power of Bitcoin to change the world, which at that time, the founders believed 
it wa- was uh, Bitcoin's ability to be an efficient medium of exchange, more importantly than just a store of value. So that's why. There was an interesting quote uh, today that uh, Charles Hoskinson gave during his end speech, which I kind of really liked, where he described miners as sort of mercenaries, where they're not people who, and so he was explaining why he likes proof of stake over proof of work. And he said that miners are these like sort of mercenaries who are just, you know, showing up and doing their job and mining for the profit, and then they don't have a stake in the project. And from what it seems like what you're describing, it seems that the goal of Bitmain is to not be a mercenary. And you you guys do want to be active participants in the governance and ecosystem around the coins that you're participating in. Yes and no. So there are coins uh, like Bitcoin, which are truly decentralized, uh, which has no founding association, no f- uh, foundation deciding uh, what happens to the protocol. And the uh, same with Bitcoin Cash. And they are also the coins that our founders started Bitmain with in their hearts. So these are very important to Bitmain. But when it comes to protocol changes on other coins, we are still learning. We are not in a position yet to know what is best for those coins. But as we learn, we hope to contribute more actively and do what is best for the long-term growth of those ecosystems. But at this time, we are just listening and learning from the communities themselves do you think it is the role of the mining pool operators to be these active participants in governance? And this is sort of what 2017 was about. It was just like, at least the Bitcoiners frame it as just like battle for control between the miners and the users. And from my perspective, it seems clear that the developers and the users won that battle. Would you say that's a fair assessment of the results of the last two years? It's hard to say yes, because if I do, it is misleading. I'll tell you why. So you're talking about Segwit2x versus USF. I think that's probably the most famous example, yeah. USF won because it was the case where you create a nuclear bomb and you say, I will blow this bomb and everyone on planet Earth if you don't do what I say. And then you get what you wanted because most of the world wants the best interest of the earth or people on the earth. And that is what USF was. It was very risky for Bitcoin. It could have the risk of reorg with wipeouts because it wasn't with any replay protection. And Peter Risen published a paper or report, or it was a BUIP he published, which explained that the chances of a reorg wipeout if USF was done were as high as 11% with just 70% of the hash rate. Could you describe really two. quickly what a wipeout it means? Wipeout is where a second fork can replay transactions on the original chain and wipe out the transaction history, which is where the value of Bitcoin comes from. So if that's ever wiped out, Bitcoin would have zero value or it would just plummet. Yeah, people ask me all the time and people probably hear that question to everyone in the crypto space hears that question from people outside the space, which is what gives Bitcoin value? It is the ledger. And it is the fact that everyone in the world knows that this Bitcoin that I gave to you is given to you by me and it's yours now. If there's no ledger, Bitcoin has no value. That is how grave this threat of US was. So if you think that the people who were creating noise with USF hats won, yeah, they did, but they won because the victory was given to them by the people who really cared about Bitcoin more than the people who were wearing these USF hats and talking on social media. Recently, Blockstream announced their new mining pool. And, you know, I have some mixed feelings about that. But one thing I was super excited to see was in their mining pool, they're using the better hash protocol, which gives a lot of power back to individual miners and away from the pool operator. So you're mining with a pool so you can get the reward sharing. They don't control your governance participation. Would this be something that Bitmain uh, would be interested in looking into with its pools? So at Bitmain, like I mentioned before in the example of how Bitmain became from an underdog chip maker to the biggest chip maker in the space, or from uh, no mining pools to having one biggest large scale mining pool and then having two largest mining pools, it's because it listens to the customers and give what the customers want. And right now, most of the mining farm owners 
They do not want to choose themselves. They don't want to decide and read every day and follow what's happening in the scaling or debates of Bitcoin or what's happening on the Bitcoin uh, protocol level debates and vote on things. They don't want to do that. They want to outsource that to the mining pool and let the mining pool give it its profit or uh, give the miner his profit. And that is what uh, would give them a good mining experience. And that's very important for Bitmain to do. So if the day comes when all mining pool owners or most of our customers are asking for a better hash kind of algorithm, uh, sure, why not? Are there cases where maybe miners might want to just delegate to you guys what coins to even mine? So for example, let you guys figure out whether to mine Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash and like allow you to shuffle voting mining power across chains like that? That's already the case in a way. Because every miner and every mining pool offers its miners or users the option to automatically switch between whichever is more profitable. And most users choose that. So the users don't need to think. Even the mining pool doesn't need to manually decide. It's just automatic. Given the uh, level of voting power that you know Bitmain does have, or Bitmain-owned mining pools have, how does that it manage balancing that with governance decisions that may affect Bitmain's primary business. So the class, you know, the historical example is the case about covert ASIC boost. But even today, when in Ethereum, we have this debate around, uh, you know, ProgPow versus keeping ETH hash, and you guys have the E9 miners already. So for one, could you tell us a little bit of the history of, you know, for people who aren't very familiar about the ASIC boost? So ASIC boost was an optimization technique for mining Bitcoin. So three years ago, envisioning ASIC Boost to be an open patent in the future, we started adding chips, uh, support on our chips for ASIC Boost. And then two years ago, some known malicious actors in the Bitcoin community raised allegations that against Bitmain, saying Bitmain is secretly using ASIC Boost to compete with Bitmain's own customers, which, are, which who are the biggest income generators for Bitmain. And it made it seem like some kind of an attack on Bitcoin. Although we had never used it, on the mainnet, we had tested on the testnet is all. And later it turns out that the same people who were raising these allegations against Bitmain were hailing another miner maker called uh, Dragon Mint Miner as uh, the Bitmain killer. And that one was also using ASIC Boost to get some kind of a competitive edge over Bitmain's uh, miner of that time. Majority of the community wants to implement ProgPow. At what point does Bitmain... Let's say it has the majority hash power, which it does not right now in Ethereum. A coalition of miners who, they all have ASICs, and they don't want to switch a prog pow. When do the miners give in to the community? When it hurts their... In this case, it wouldn't be for Bitmain to decide. This would be for these miners that you mentioned. Does Bitmain not run a mining pool on Ethereum? We have on that pool. So you do have to make part of a decision, right? In this case, we wouldn't because we will let the users of the mining pool decide. And the users will most likely in such a case, if there are many considerable number of users who are mining Ethereum with ASICs, they will probably fork it off. They will probably uh, keep the original chain and let Ethereum fork off with their with proof proc pow. And that's what's happened with so many other coins. With Sia coin, when the founder of Sia coin decided to monopolize ASICs by activating some kind of backdoor that he had put in his own cryptocurrency. It Sia Classic was found. Sia Classic continues the original algorithm, which is open to any ASIC manufacturer, while Sia Coin can only be mined by ASICs manufactured by the founder of Sia Coin. So when it comes to this decision-making, for example, let's say Bitmain is signaling to stay on ETHash, anti pow. Now, enough of the community or of your miners want to switch to promote ProgPow, right? Do you think it's the responsibility of the mining pool operator to change their signaling? Or is the onus on the miners to vote with their feet by pointing to a different mining pool? I think the uh, ideal result or what would actually happen if it was a Bitmain controlled mining pool is the mining pool would offer services to both the ProgPow people and to also the Ethash people. But for the, so they did offer the way to signal both? I'm talking about for the governance process of how miners are signaling. The miners would signal then, not the pool itself. By moving with their feed? Yeah, they would give them some uh, kind of options, maybe like a survey to, for all their users, because the 
pool users, there's no defined ways for them to vote. The users are for pool. So the pool may send out a survey for everyone to fill up. That would be a way to go forward. Let's move on and now talk a little bit about, you know, what's the more current events of Bitmain over the last year or so. You know, you guys had a pretty publicly attempted IPO. Could you talk a little bit about that? So we uh, redisclosed uh, the information of our IPO in a blog post in the beginning of this year where we summed uh, uh, our last year and talked about the IPO as well. So we had applied for the IPO in Hong Kong, as you know, because the application is public and it wasn't accepted by the regulators in Hong Kong exchange. So we plan to go IPO in the future at an appropriate time. You know, one of the things I've also heard, though, is that part of the hesitation, you know, it was maybe a little bit of bad timing with the IPO and that the Bitcoin market had just crashed. And how much do you think that was an impact on the IPO process? It's hard for me to say because I don't know what goes on in the regulators' brains or, and I shouldn't even speculate on what the regulators think or may have thought. But if I was a, a decision maker for Hong Kong Exchange, I would uh, certainly see it as a negative point and not a positive point in the application if the prices were too low. Because an exchange always does care about its revenue as well. So if they can see a new listing that can bring a lot of revenue for the exchange, they might make some trade-offs. And so this um, shift towards this AI and machine learning aspect of the company, would you say that this is sort of in response to hedging against the crypto market as a whole, where like, you know, Bitmain doesn't want to put all its eggs in one basket of saying, oh, we're completely dependent on the status of the crypto space? Well, it wasn't the case. And it's not a shift because we started making chips for AI in 2016 and we've released four generations since then. So we've been making chips even through the bull market of Bitcoin. There's no shift of focus. It's just another business of Bitmain. And it's not about hedging our risk on the crypto market. It is about taking our success and expertise and experience to more areas that benefit the world than just cryptocurrencies. At the beginning of this year, or maybe it was the end of last year, Jihan stepped down as a CEO. Was this sort of in response to the performance of the company last year? It wasn't a reactionary measure or a response to uh, whatever happened because of the cryptocurrency markets. It was a natural uh, evolution of the company where uh, the founders and the board decided to give the wheel to someone who is proven to be very competent, someone who really cares about the company and can do the job very well. Is Jihan still actively involved with the company or has he moved on to... Sure, he is. He and Mike Ree both are still actively involved with the what company. What are their roles right now? So they are uh, members of the board of Bitmain now. I've also heard that Jihan has been working on some new projects in Singapore. Are you able to comment on those? That's uh, the news talking about him starting another company and leaving Bitmain which is not the case. One of the co-founders of Bitmain, there was a third co-founder, Yu Shanga or John, if that's his English name. He founded uh, Matrix, this OTC trading desk uh, slash custodian solution that the media connected to Jihan. Could you tell, you know, one last question about like, wh what do you see as the future of Bitmain? So, you know, there is this focus on AI and machine learning. Do, are you guys interested in proof of stake at all? Like, a number of the large mining pools, F2 pool is pretty active in the staking space now. Uh, they have a related company called Bitfish and uh, Spark Pool is also running on, I, I'm familiar with a lot of the validators on Cosmos. And so a lot of these large mining pools are running pretty large validators on Cosmos. So is this something that Bitmain is looking into? Uh, we are surely looking into it, but uh, we don't have any plans of uh, offering these services like them right now. Having said that, we continue to have our focus on making the best chips for cryptocurrency mining as well as for AI. And we'll, yeah, that will remain the focus of Bitmain to make the best chips. Well, Nishant, it's been great having you on and learning a lot about Bitmain and the history and clearing the air yeah. on a lot of some of the things that, you know, I hear about on like Twitter and Reddit and stuff and really getting a better understanding of some of the things in Bitmain. It so. was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. 
You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.